This show is part of the RetroZap.com podcast network. And welcome everybody to episode 81 of the Animaniacast. Which way did he go, George? Which way did he go? Time for a little sit down, Skippy. Don't bench me, Sloppy, please. Well, all right, but for crying out loud, keep your head down. Right, Coach. Ha! I stole it, Sloppy. I stole the ball. Attaboy, Skippy. That's it. You got it, kid. You got it. <laughs> He got it. And welcome once again to the Animated Cast. We are the only podcast out there that's dedicated to the animated series, Animaniacs. And here we explore the series episode by episode exploring all the cultural references and gags that we can find. And in the end, we give each episode a Water Tower rating. I am Joey, and joining me are my co-hosts, my brother Nathan. I see Joey's belly button. I see Joey's belly button. Oh, gosh, i got to turn off video Skype. Okay. And joining us from across the country, it's Kelly. Hi. Hi. Uh, well, today, guys, we are going to be talking about episode 81 of Animaniacs. Uh, it includes some uh, pretty good segments here. Uh, Soccer Coach Slappy, Belly Button Blues, our, fa- <laughs> our final space cartoon, we promise, and a valuable lesson. Uh, well, let's see. This is a this is an interesting assortment of uh, cartoons. <laughs> What would you guys say about this episode if someone were to ask you in just a few words? Uh, Nathan, let's start with you. Um, it, it has a 2001 Space Odyssey uh, reference in it, I guess. <laughs> Several, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and Kelly, what about you? I would say, thus spake Zarathustra. I have no idea what that means. That is a reference that, that we read over my head. the music in 2001 of the Space Odyssey. Oh my gosh. See, I just, um, I just know it's the theme from 2001. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I had no idea that that, see, I, I was wondering about that in um, today's episode because it's a public domain song and yet uh, we have these like 2001 parodies that are kind of dispersed throughout this whole cartoon and in the very first segment they don't play the song they play kind of a uh, a variation of it and i thought to myself well why do that i mean it's not like uh, he's gonna sue you or anything right isn't that like a classical music song or is that, is that... i thought that too. i had that same song yeah so i don't know it's it, i mean i guess you know hey it's what they <laughs> what they did on animaniacs all the time it's just part of uh of uh, their thing, so they just continue to do it, just just in case. Better safe than sorry, I suppose. But <laughs> but yeah, this this cartoon has a, a bunch of different segments, uh, kind of smaller segments. There's uh, quite a few of them, though. Before we get into all the our discussion of it, Nathan, tell us when did this episode first premiere? Okay, so this episode first premiered on Saturday, February 3rd of 1996, which was the same day as the release of the previous episode of Animaniacs. What? Oh, it was also uh, a week before the uh, action movie Broken Arrow was released and two weeks before the release of Muppet Treasure Island and Happy Gilmore. Well, there we go. I I saw Broken Arrow and, uh, of course, Muppets Treasure Island and Happy Gilmore. Nice. Now, Kelly, which... I think I saw Happy Gilmore under duress. Um, <laughs> it was on, and I was around, and then, um, <laughs> and of course, I, I don't remember Broken Arrow, but I think John Travolta's in it. But that's all I remember. They're tra- they're getting a missile, like it's it's about. I think all Is I remember. That what, Christian Slater. Is yeah, it? Christian Slater, oh, John mm-hmm. Travolta. They're they're trying to intercept a nuclear weapon, I think, as it travels across the country, or. Something like that. I, I, that's all I really remember. It's, it, it's a mediocre action film of, uh, 1996. <laughs> the 90s were pretty good for, for 
mediocre time action films. Yeah, they, you don't really think and about some them. really good ones. <laughs> yeah, but that was the thing. It's like in the '90s, you had all the you know nonstop action films and pretty bad, uh, for the most part, pretty bad superhero films. And now we have just a ton of superhero films and not some so many uh, straight up action films. You notice that? Like, if it's an action film, it's almost always a superhero film. It seems. I know. At mm-hmm. least the successful Boring. ones, anyway. Well, even the action movies are superhero movies now. You know, like Fast and the Furious, they're basically superheroes. They can do anything. <laughs> yeah. They're we, like flying cars, more, oh, basically. Well, I was going to say we need more Indiana Jones, but no. no. Yes, yes, we do. No. One more time. <laughs> I love Indiana Jones. I do. But I... No. <laughs> I'm I'm going to it one more. Hey, I they can't. I I don't I don't dislike the Crystal Skull, and I think they could do it. I think they could do it one more time, uh, and and close it off on a really good note. Is my without hope. Shia, it I think it'll be tons better. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> here's hoping. And of course, we had Muppet Treasure Island, which I think that was an okay Muppet movie. Some people love that one. I think it's, it was not as good as. Muppet Christmas Carol, and it seems, yeah. and that's the one that they were like. Seems like they're going off that model of we'll have Gonzo and Rizzo be the narrators for this one again, and um, it just didn't work as well. I think they kind of that's, abandoned that whole formula right after. But Muppet it had Pedro. Tim Curry. That's true. Tim mm-hmm. Curry was a good uh, captain. Uh, was it? He was a bad guy. Yeah, uh, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I the little boy annoyed me in that. I, I just remember not liking the boy in Muppet Treasure Island. <laughs> and you were a, and you were a kid as well. Like it takes a lot of, for mm-hmm. a kid to annoy another kid so much. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading on Reddit earlier. Um, somebody had posted about the Indian in the cupboard, and there seemed to be a consensus that so many people disliked the kid in that movie, I even heard... when they were kids. Okay, I was listening to um, the Deuce Cast movie show, which is a retro zap podcast here and they were saying that the indian um the kid is was ugly <laughs> i was like i don't remember oh. the kid being ugly but uh i didn't think yeah i saw the picture earlier when they posted mm. it and um no i hate i mean he has some curly hair going on but well that's a frank not, oz directed film by the way so there you I, go believe me i know <laughs> <laughs> i saw it when it came out <laughs> i've never seen it since but I saw it when it came out. Oh. And I remember the Darth Vader um, in the commercial. There well, was a, like a Darth Vader toy fighting in the cupboard. I see, think. and that's the thing. Because at that time, in, in that point in movie history, having even just a moment, a few seconds of Darth Vader was a big deal. Oh, like... my God. And, I, well, th- and they were talking about, and I don't remember this, but they said he was fighting a T-Rex. And it's just like Darth Vader fighting a T-Rex is the most epic thing that could ever happen and i'm pretty sure i recorded the commercial just so i could go back and watch it <laughs> no yes no it's not a game <laughs> don't put them together you know cowboys and indians Duh. Hey, hey everybody's so big you can't they're people you can't use people Learn to be a man. You should not do magic. You do not understand. From the best loved classic of adventure and imagination. I will be with you when the sun rises. One more time. The Indian in the cupboard. Well, that was our movie discussion for this (laughs) week. Uh, but we have we have other movie references to talk about for this one. First of all, this uh, first cartoon there's a there's a couple 2001 uh, parodies, and we're going to kind of group those together for a little later in this uh, in this episode when it kind of makes sense to talk about the movie 2001 at the same time. This cartoon, however, starts off with another brand new variable verse. And that was Bowling Laney. Bowling Laney. I really liked the bowling lanes that they were in because the bowling lanes were called the Tidy Bowl, which I thought that's cool. Of course, Tidy Bowl being the uh, 
toilet bowl cleaner uh, company or, or cleanser or whatever. So I thought that was kind of cool. Hello, listener. This is Jess Hanel, the voice of Wacko and Animaniacs, and you're listening to Animania Cast, which is the best thing you could possibly listen to, especially if you're not wearing pants. I'd love to go on talking to you, but I can't because I've got a potty emergency. See you later. Let's go ahead and get into our first cartoon, really. It's uh, Soccer Coach Slappy. <laughs> So Soccer Coach Slappy was written by Nick Dubois. It was directed by John McClanahan and Rusty <laughs> Mills. And Kelly, tell us what happens here in Soccer Coach Slappy. Well, oh, I, I want to point out that the intro song has gone back to the original Slappy song. It's not the Slappy and Skippy one that we've been seeing. That's right. We haven't seen that since like season two, I believe. Yeah, I was. I was at first. I thought Skippy wasn't going to be in the episode because of that. You know, like maybe that's why they did it. But then I saw him. I have no clue why they went back to that. But that's fine. <laughs> I like it. So um, Slappy is a coach um, for a soccer team that Skippy's on. And I a I don't understand why she's the coach, and b I don't understand why Skippy's on the team because he's horrible. Yeah. And. And she's horrible. Like, she doesn't even... I don't know. I want you to march onto that field and beat those bozos into a quiche Lorraine. All right! Now go out there and do whatever it is you do in soccer. With luck, I'll still get home in time to watch Geraldo. None of it makes sense. But he um, he gets out on the field and wants to play soccer, and he keeps being hit by the ball, like, right in his head. And he goes over the sidelines and she says, okay, maybe you should sit down on the bench. He's like, no, no, I want to play. I want to play. And, you know, you've got to give him kudos for, for enthusiasm. Where's the ball? Over there. Great. You go over there. Now I want to play. I haven't seen anyone get hit in the kisser this much since Milton Berle. Every time he gets hit, he collapses on the ground and he cries, very reminiscent of Bumby's mom episode. <laughs> when he starts crying, goes, Bumby's mom! <laughs> and just wailing. And so she says, well, maybe maybe now it's time to sit on the bench. And he's like, no, 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 I want to get out there, I want to get out there. So, I, I don't know, this happened like four times or something. And um, so... Finally, she comes up with an idea and I guess decides to put him somewhere where he can be of use and also play. So somehow he's inserted into the World Cup soccer game at the very last minute when there's 30 seconds left and they've made him the goalie. Is it is it goalie? Yeah, no, that's OK. Like, <laughs> We're that's we know that's sports. Not... OK, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have no idea. Brazil has the ball and is charging down the field. Dunga to Romero. Romero breaks loose. Babeto is wide open. Romero to Babeto. Oh, these are the best shooters in the game, folks. Babeto shoots straight at the new American goalkeeper. Can he save it? He blocks the the score, and the U.S. wins the soccer the the World Cup soccer soccer thing. So um, they're all <laughs> excited, excited, and you know the team comes running towards them. He's saved the game, and you know uh, good job. And uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah, and they get like an endorsement deal at the very end. It's like almost like an epilogue at the very end. You think it's all wrapped up, and then they go up one more time to show them. Uh, Dressed up in World Cup fatigues for USA and uh, the end. There's a few references in it real quick. I mean, really, the only references are, of course, who Sloppy is mentioning uh, for the most part. I mean, she mentions George Foreman a few times because he keeps getting hit in the head. And I think George Foreman at this point, and now everybody knows him basically as the, the grill guy. But at this point, I think he came out of retirement in the 90s and was uh, doing a little bit of boxing here and there. So... 
yeah, boxer George Foreman gets mentioned a couple times. Uh, Milton Berle uh, gets mentioned. And, of course, uh, there's uh, also Henny Youngman is mentioned. So and I think that's about I think that's all the people. Oh, wait, no. She's also a talk show fan as well. So there's Ricky Lake and Geraldo are mentioned as uh, what uh, she would rather be watching at the at the moment instead of doing soccer coaching. So there you go. There's our there's our little cultural references right there. And can uh, you hear the dog? Yes. Oh shoot. <laughs> I can too. We have we have Indiana Indiana in the background. Kelly Kelly doesn't want to see another Indiana movie, but she loves her dog Indiana. I well I do. And I named him that just so I could say we named the dog Indiana. We named the dog Indiana. I think he's barking at the thunder because it's storming here. Oh. We, yeah. Well, I, it, we'll let him be the guest host on this this episode okay. right now today. Don't Sorry. worry about it. He's usually a lot more he, he's usually a lot more a lot more quiet. No, Indy Indy is free to come on microphone anytime to voice his opinion on this episode. <laughs> so he's trying to tell us everybody what's what his thoughts were, but we're just not. I'm sorry. We I, for for those people who don't understand dog, I guess we can't put them on. But whatever. <laughs> um, but that was the you know basically the cultural references that I could that I could see. Nathan Kelly, what are your thoughts on this uh, first cartoon? Let's uh, let's start with you, Nathan. Um, it was it was all right. Like this is the one that uh, Tom was talking about uh, that Nathan didn't feel that skippy would act this way right this is, yes exactly uh a few, he was like i i know skippy he wouldn't be crying at you know <laughs> yeah and uh i thought that was such a funny um story that's uh in case you, you haven't listened to it folks there's uh we back in december of 2017 we interviewed and i don't know the episode number off the top of my head but um we interviewed uh tom as well as his sons uh nathan luke and cody and they all talked about working on Animaniacs, but yeah, Tom Ruger did mention that Nathan did not like this uh, scene of crying. He doesn't think that Skippy would cry. I remember coming home with, uh, I think it was soccer coach Slappy, uh, and uh, I, I would give the scripts to the kids like the day before so they could at least get an idea of what was going on. And in soccer coach Slappy, I, Nathan kept getting hit with the ball in the head. I mean, excuse me, Skippy. And and I think Nathan uh, was asked to cry. It, and I, do you remember this conversation we had? And Nathan really, uh, you know, he felt like, he said, you know, I feel like uh, I know what this character, I, I don't think my character would cry in this situation. <laughs> 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 and so we had quite the uh, argument. And I said, well, can I pull some crying from a previous episode? <laughs> Like you have to cry. That's what made it so kind of the the repetition of him crying was so funny. My guess is it's just alternate crying or maybe even just the same crying from Bumby's mom. Like Kelly was saying, it sounded mm -hmm. very I, I similar. So. Yeah. So uh, you know, I, I just I can totally see. My oh, gosh, how a whole how old must Nate have been at this time? Eleven or twelve? I'm guessing. Uh I just I would love to see this this discussion of. uh of of Nathan, you know, really getting into character. No, Skippy wouldn't cry at this point. This is <laughs> not. What's my motivation, Dad? No. <laughs> <laughs> Which way did he go, George? Which way did he go? Well, it's it's rumored, I guess, I, that uh, the whole like, which way did he go, George? Like that whole thing was Nathan's idea, I guess, was which was funny. Yeah, uh, that, no. I did like that. Which way did he go, George? He Which, said it a I bunch guess, of times. It's funny. Yeah, and that's like the reference to that old like Looney Tunes cartoon, uh, like of Fox and the Hound, which I guess is a reference to of Mice and Men. Yes, right? like because that guy's name was George in that. So I, yeah. yeah, they had a bunch of guys who say, "Which way did he go, George?" Like a bunch of them would say that. Like, but almost any Looney Tunes character, if you hit him on the head hard enough, they'll say, "Which way did he go, George?" <laughs> so, yeah, that was cute. Um. But Kelly, what did you like about this first cartoon? I thought it was funny how Slappy used her intellect to put Skippy somewhere where he would actually be helpful. Like, you know, instead of just 
finally stopping the cycle of going over and over and over again where he was you know crying on the field and getting hit she she put him somewhere where he was actually uh good at at the soccer yeah he was a soccer ball magnet so he had to use that talent somehow right it worked that's my nephew always using his head now i smell endorsements and skippy i guess yeah it, it ends up becoming a good uh a good ending for Skippy, despite the concussions that he sustains. Oh. It's it's all good. They got endorsements. Uh, any other uh, things that Nathan that you thought were kind of cool in this cartoon before we move on? Um, it's just that Skippy is so eager to get right back up, even though he keeps getting hurt. So good job, Skippy. Well, let's go ahead and move on to the next cartoon, and that is called Belly Button Blues. <laughs> Well, Belly Button Blues was written by Nicholas Hollander and directed by Liz Halsman. Kelly, this is, we all know that Katie Kaboom is your favorite segment. So, of course, you have to tell us about it. What happens here in uh, Belly Button Blues? Well, it's um, your standard Katie Kaboom episode. Uh, she comes downstairs getting ready for school and she's wearing a crop top and her belly button showing, which, uh, in my school, we never would have been allowed to wear that. And so her mom's kind of got a point, but she, she's like, she's like, you're not wearing that. And, and she said, everybody's wearing it at school. And her mom says, well, you may wear it at school, but you're not wearing it in the house. And, uh, her brother starts making fun of her. And as little brothers do, cause I have one. <laughs> and he's like, I can see your belly button. And she's getting annoyed. And then her dad comes in and, he makes a comment and she just goes off the rails and says, you're always taking her side. And he, he's got this look on his face like, what did I just walk into? Yeah. I'm just drinking my coffee. Yeah, I got to go running late. Kiss. Bye bye. Mm. Have fun at kindergarten there, Tinker. Hey, pumpkin. Nice belly button. Oh, you always take her side. What, what, what I say? Uh oh, here we go again. That's my dance! Yeah! Sound the alert! Sound the alert! My day! My day! I'm not changing my clothes! Then she starts spewing clothes from her mouth and just causing destruction and chaos everywhere in her family puts on their uh i don't know their little hats and vests and you know armor i guess and um trying to uh, reduce the damages and uh finally she storms out of the house and then she comes back and like she's back to normal and she's wearing a sweater and she says oh it's actually cold outside today and then leaves <laughs> They just kind of look at her in disbelief. Yeah. And, of course, the house falls apart once again. The end. I can't imagine what their house and home insurance is like. Oh, like how, I, how can they even <laughs> totally. I guess if you were going to say the only thing that really changes with Katie Kaboom episodes is what she gets upset about and what she's what she's going to what kind of monster she's going to turn into this time. I mean, at least she doesn't turn into the same monster each time. That would be mm -hmm. too repetitive. Right. So at least we got a new monster design. Like Kelly said, this one spews clothes out of its mouth, which is kind of weird. So it has a huge belly button. Yeah. Like almost <laughs> like a, a yeah, exactly. The belly button got even worse and like a like was a girl like swirl around the belly and everything like that. It uh, it she. Yeah. <laughs> It was, it was, it was weird, but then again, it is just a Katie Kaboom episode or, or segment, and there's not really too much to, to talk about, to say about it, other than, uh, it's, yeah, I don't, I don't know. What did you, what did you guys like about this one? Anything? That's what I thought. No. <laughs> <laughs> I will, <laughs> okay, we'll leave it with this one. Hey, I found out something. That her brother is in kindergarten, which I thought, wow, he's in kindergarten. He looks too bigger than he should be in kindergarten, mm -hmm. but uh, whatever. Uh, I also thought that uh, Katie's uh, shirt 
It, it was very odd looking the way that the puffy sleeves were on top. Did, was it just me or did that look like a little off? Like her, I don't know. I don't remember anybody in the nineties wearing a shirt with big puffy shoulders like that in a, you know, with a midriff showing. So I don't know what happened with Katie's fashion sense, but it's probably for the best that she ended up putting on a sweatshirt because that was a just an ugly looking shirt to begin with. Katie. Oh my gosh, she's in the room! You're making fun of me! Ah! <laughs> Ooh, that was scary. That was scary. Well, anyway, the, the, let's let's not say anything mean about Katie. Otherwise, uh, you know, she'll come in here to <laughs> and destroy us and all. And go kaboom. And go kaboom. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to these 2001 parodies. So there are two um, kind of like bumper segments, I guess we could call them. Um, they kind of they basically introduce the both the show today and uh, then one of the cartoons. So the first time they show a parody of 2001, it's uh, the Warners and they're all kind of cavemen, kind of walking around in fur coats, and it's a very you know a lot of the shots are similar uh, to the opening shots in the actual movie directed by Stanley Kubrick, uh, 2001. And, uh, you know, so they're showing some animals just kind of eating, stretching, stuff like that. And the Warners see this monolith. And, you know, of course, in the movie, it's just this black monolith that can give you knowledge and stuff. It's from aliens or something. I don't know. They don't really, they never really tell you in 2001 or in the book. But um, the Warners go over to it, and they touch it, and it turns out to be a giant TV. And so they turn it on, and baloney goes on the TV set, and they're so horrified they have to change the channel. And luckily they change it to the Warner, like, must be the WB. And uh, the only sad thing is they can't get the clock to work. They have a little flashing 12 on their clock, which I don't think kids understand that today, that that little joke. (laughs) It seems like I had to go to my grandmother's house and my parents were always like, whenever there be a, you know, this is, you know, Kelly's in a storm right now. Whenever a storm would take out the power or whatever, uh, there would, you know, you'd always have to reset the clocks on the VCRs all around the house. And some people just kept them flashing on 12 the entire time. And if the power went out while you were asleep in the middle of the night, like the struggle was real because your alarm wouldn't go off in the morning. Yep, exactly. Now everyone's on their cell phone. You don't even know what time it was when you woke up. (laughs) That's very true. Yeah, gosh, all these different ways that, I mean, I remember now that you mentioned it, Nathan, I, you know, would have to watch the the news in the morning and like look at the counter in the the right-hand corner to see, okay, what time is it right now? Um, (laughs) To set my (laughs) clocks and everything. Gosh. Tough. It was tough in the 90s, kids. Let me tell you something. Oh, boy. <laughs> but the next uh, 2001 parody uh, there was was uh, they're in their little space pod. And uh, Wacko gets out of it. And he's dressed up in his little orange 2001 spacesuit. And uh, kind of floats towards Jupiter. But in this case, it's not Jupiter. Jupiter is a giant TV set. And when he turns it on... Uh, well, it goes to the Katie Kaboom cartoon. So uh, that all leads, of course, into our final space cartoon, We Promise. And our final space cartoon, We Promise, was written by Gordon Bresick and Charles M. Howe IV. It was directed by Charles Vizier. And basically in this one, yeah, it's the rest of it's a little bit more of a 2001. Uh, instead of uh, Hal 9000, it's Al 5000. And uh, the Warners wake up a little early. They, in the space suit, they are they're about, they're going on their way to Pluto. You'll have to return to your sleeping chambers. Resuscitation isn't scheduled until we're close to Pluto. Sorry, if I sleep anymore, I'll be close to Goofy. As long as we don't get too close to Uranus. I thought we discussed cutting that line. We did. My fault. 
Try showing up for rehearsal. Sorry. Al 5000 says, if you don't go to sleep right now, I'm going to have to kill you. I'm going to have to turn off life support. Uh, there's a cute little moment where they say, like, okay, let's all get into the pod and talk about this. And we're definitely not going to talk about, uh, you know, you. So don't read our lips. Uh, which alludes to the fact that, of course, in the movie 2001, the robot, of course, does read their lips. Spoilers. Yeah. And... <laughs> But in this case, the Animaniacs, the Warners are just simply putting on, you know, Dot is putting on lipstick. And, you know, you look at y- Yakko and he's just kind of, bloop, 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 you know, doing stuff with his his lips, putting his finger across his lips. I don't remember what Wacko was doing. I don't know if he was doing anything. But main point is they w- all... Wacko was doing the gookie or whatever. Well, yeah, the, he just does a gookie. Whatever that's called. No wonder I didn't remember it because he always does the gookie. I don't... <laughs> it doesn't make... has no effect on me anymore at this point. We've decided. In outer space, it's okay to wear white shoes after Labor Day. And then they uh, unplug a bunch of uh, computer chips from uh, Al 5000. And instead of singing Daisy, Daisy, like in 2001, he starts kind of doing the presidential theme anthem. And they open up the computer. And who's inside the Al 5000? It's Al Gore. Tom, Tom. Ta-dum, 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 ta-dum. I don't get it. He's still running even though he's not plugged in. Wait a sec. Stiff, boring, humorless, not plugged in, named Al. It's the vice president. I still have the utmost confidence in the administration, Bill. Now there's a space oddity. That's, that's, our, that's our cartoon right there. Uh... What do you guys think of these, I'm just going to say, of these 2001 parodies in general? Uh, Kelly, let's start with you. I thought they were pretty funny. Um, Definitely, I I, I think that even if someone hadn't seen the movie, the references were broad enough that, you know, anyone would probably pick up on it. And... um, it did remind me of the time I saw the movie, and I was like, I don't, I don't understand this film. Yeah, now, and I, I was trying to remember. I don't think when, with the whole Al Gore thing, when he talks about having full confidence in the presidency and yada yada yada, I thought that was something in reference to like the impeachment of Bill Clinton. But I think Maybe. I don't think I think this happened before all of that happened, though, because this is 1996, and I'm pretty sure all the Monica Lewinsky stuff happened in Bill Clinton's second term, if I'm not mistaken, and and uh, so this that wouldn't be any reference to any of the impeachment stuff that Bill Clinton had to to go through. So I'm not exactly sure why the joke with Al Gore I think was a, fell a little bit flat, but it was still different. I mean, they don't really. I think a lot of people when they're looking forward to the Animaniacs reboot and stuff, they're like, "Oh, I can't wait for them to really take on." politics and stuff like that but they really didn't do too much political humor in the original show this is one of the only times they did it and they um it wasn't that great <laughs> it was okay well, because it, it, it so easily and quickly gets dated yeah and this is one example where you're like wait a minute what was exactly going on and i bet there's some kids that have i mean they watch it today they would have no idea who al gore is and so yeah nathan what did you think about these 2001 parodies it reminded me of a movie I saw once, uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. No. Uh, that was a, I, I think that was a good movie. Uh, yeah. So you so you, you liked the movie. When did you first see this movie, Nathan? Oh, only like a couple of years ago. Probably like uh, two or three years ago. Yeah, yeah, that's about when I saw it. Yeah, I saw <laughs> I, I went online immediately trying to figure out like what the ending and the, the room and what I... I yeah, so, I think I the like, whole ending I, I would cut. Why don't I understand this movie? <laughs> I think I would cut it after um, the whole at Hal scene. Like, the, I think that's when I would, I'd be like, "There we go, that's good." Like, after once it gets into that creep, weird, like freaky uh, stuff, I'd probably cut all once that. Once he out. goes into the the monolith, right? Mm-hmm. And then he yeah. goes into a trippy psychedelic world, and then it turns into the Star Baby and stuff, and. Mm-hmm. Everything that. before that, I thought was really awesome, and like, like 
it's surprisingly well done for visually it's amazing yeah exactly and like i really you really start feeling for hal like as he's being destroyed like even though he's like this evil thing like it just i really like that part of the movie enough to to excuse the the rest of the rest you can just kind of put on in the background and not really pay too much attention to because <laughs> well like, whatever <laughs> i i think i've seen the whole movie all the way through or at least you know 2001 is a very long movie and it's one of those movies i think i've kind of pick up bits and pieces of and then puzzle piece it together <laughs> afterwards i did read the book though in high school i read the book and uh i liked the book so much that i read the sequel as well 2010 which I know they made a se- that that into a movie as well. They made the movie 2010. I think Roy Scheider stars in that one. Say, I should watch that one because I love Roy Scheider. Yeah, so maybe you'd like that one. I think Roy Scheider's in it, and uh, just like uh, Sequest, I believe there's dolphins involved in 2010. Oh, oh, I am- on that why didn't i know that before well i don't know if it's just one scene but <laughs> i seem i do remember i do remember you said roy scheider dolphins and sequest i'm there <laughs> there you go but uh yeah it, of course you know nathan do you know the the significance of what the what the letters hal for in 2001 stand for well, I've heard it's IBM, but I also heard that's wrong. What? It's the one that I heard that I think the creator was like, oh, I think that's, I mean, it may be a subconscious thing, but it wasn't an intentional. Really? I oh, always I hear. I, I see what you're saying. One it's letter. I. Yeah. A, B. Yeah. And L, M. Yeah. The, yeah. I think Arthur C. I, I, we'll have to look up that later because I always look thought Arthur up. C. Clark, uh, said that, uh, that he, predicted you know there's a lot of predictions in 2001 when you know he actually did think of course that we'd be able to do inter- interplanetary space travel and have bases on the moon in 2001 um and he thought that uh, ibm would be the main computer company uh so therefore hal uh came from that just one letter under each one so i don't know i'll tell you one person who's a big fan of uh 2001 and that is writer of Animaniacs, Paul Rugg, because he was just posting on uh, on his Facebook feed a little while ago talking about it being uh, shown in uh, one of the... I forget which movie theater it's being shown. It was showing like a, like all, like a marathon of it was being shown uh, over and over again, and he loved that movie and posted about it. So, you know, it's not for everybody. You have to be in the certain... I think you have to be in the certain um, mood to watch the movie 2001. Mm-hmm. It's definitely not a science fiction film like Star Wars. It helped influence Star Wars, but uh, don't expect to be action-packed kind of film. Just kind of get... Yeah, I think there was a lot more appreciation for it when it came out. Yeah. Um, Because movies today are just so much more fast-paced and and action-packed, you know. Yeah, and this one was trying to be a little bit more accurate to what space travel would be like you know like no sound in space and there's no rocket ship like zooming around the place it just kind of everything moves like something should move like in space and uh some people that you know you'd watch that and go this is boring like i remember this was in in my film class in college this was a movie that we were all expected to watch and i don't i don't know if i was able to watch it or if i fell asleep during it i so (laughs) Uh, well, anyway, with that ringing endorsement for 2001, <laughs> <laughs> let's go ahead and move on to our last segment for today, and it's called Valuable Lesson. <music> Valuable Lesson was written by Paul Rugg. It was directed by Charles Vizier. Nathan, tell us what happens here in Valuable Lesson. All right, so we open up on the Animaniacs, on a, I guess they're in a tent, and uh, out comes uh, what's his face with uh, curly Attila guys, the- <laughs> Attila the Hun, and he has uh, hair curlers in his hair. <laughs> um, but they're not done. He rips them out, and his hair's all curly. Um, and then he's like, "I'm gonna destroy you guys." And then like, "No, you're not." And it's like, "Yes, we are." And then so the Animaniacs, the Warners. They uh they end up uh hurting him a lot. They uh throw cannons and drop they they shoot cannons at him and drop things on his head. It's terrible. So the uh, sensors come in and tell him to stop right away. Um, 
So they take the Warners off to the uh, network, uh, and and there they show them a little uh, cartoon called The Snugglers. In the heart of a meadow, in this tall patch of grass, live the cute and fuzzy snugglers in their huts made of glass. Uh, very reminiscent of the Smurfs, uh, so we learn all about why we should eat dirt, and then why we get <laughs> angry, and yes, Let's talk then... at length. Let's talk at length about <laughs> anger. <laughs> yes, so they sing a little song about it. We get angry when we're upset, we get angry when we're sad, we get angry when we're selfish, we get angry when we're bad. Uh, that's, uh, after that, the censor show them what kids are like with, after watching 25 episodes of The Snugglers, and they're very kind. They share, and they're nice, and they both have individuality, apparently. This is where we test all of our children's programming. Behind this window are children that have watched the Cute and Fuzzy Snugglers show 25 times. I have an idea. Let's share. I love to share. We can share and still be unique. And behind this window are children that have watched 25 of your cartoons. Would you two like to share? And your point is? Uh, that's when Attila the Hun breaks into the room saying, must destroy the Warners, and then the censors are like, hey... Attila Hunt, don't do that. That's very naughty. And then he's like, and then he attacks the censors. And then the Warners say, well, at least the censors are good for something. And then that's, uh, that's it, I guess. Cease this at once, you naughty man! Naughty man! And put those children down this instant! This instant! <laughs> You're not really naughty. <laughs> Are you? Gee, those sensors came in handy after all. Good night, everybody. I had no idea that the sensors were Margaret Thatcher and Wallace Shawn. See, I didn't know that was supposed to be... Margaret Thatcher. I guess it kind of looked... I don't know if it is, but it, 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 she just reminded me of her. It definitely... Mm-hmm. The male sensor, you could definitely see... And I thought at first it actually was Wallace Shawn. I thought it was... Me it, too. I checked the credits. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was inconceivable that it wasn't him. But of <laughs> course, <laughs> it was... Uh, he's voiced by Jeff Glenn Bennett. Uh, there's a few times, like at the very beginning, I'm like, ooh, they got Wallace Shawn to mm. be in here? And then I was like... And then the second or third line, I was like... Wait a second, that's not Wallace Shawn. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Wallace Shawn, of course, from Princess Bride and Toy Story and many, many, many other films. Uh, so he has such a, such a identifiable voice. And, uh, it's too bad they didn't get him in here. I wonder if this, if they did, I wonder if this would have been one of his first, uh, cartoon appearances if they were able to get him on. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I really, the, uh, the, the only other cultural references that I can think of is really probably a Don Knotts kind of character in the studio as they're walking in. You know, Attila Hun, who's acting a lot like the Incredible Hulk in this in this cartoon, <laughs> uh, you know, goes past this Don Knotts security guard, and Don Knotts says, "Must be the owner of one of our affiliates." Yeah, it, it's it's it started off differently than other cartoons. It was in media res, right? In the middle of things, there was no preamble to what's going on with the the Warners. It's just, hey, they're doing stuff with Attila the Hun, and then it's just kind of breaking the fourth wall. Like, let's talk about how the sausage is made, and perhaps some of the stuff that the writers actually did have to go through uh, mm. with writing these cartoons. I do know that they can't; they weren't allowed to show the Warners hitting each other or other care or other you know people with objects that um could really hurt kids um so you can't really hit anybody with like a bat you you know because kids could actually grab a bat and hit each other with it so you had to use like you know of course wacko has his mallet 
And by this point, you would not be able to show a gun being shot at somebody. So you could have, like in Turkey Jerky, have Wacko swallow some bullets and shoot them out of his mouth like a gun. So there's ways to get around it. But uh, there was, I'm sure, with uh, the censors, uh, there was a a bit of a battle with it. There's only, by the way, there's there's one time I know they did use a bat. And uh, do you guys know off the top of your head which which cartoon that was? No. no. Uh, wait, was it down, clowning out? I don't think so. I think he used the mallet only in that one. But in uh, Dracula, Dracula, oh. he says he you know uh, uh, the you know Dracula turns into a bat. So Wacko turns into a bat too, but it's a bat with bat wings. So he hits himself, you know, on Dracula's on the bat Dracula's head. So I don't know. They they were able to get around that. So if you put a if you put bat wings on a bat, it's okay to hit somebody with it, but not a real bat. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, but what do you guys think? What did you think about this episode uh, or this cartoon? I thought it was really funny, uh, and um, the. The snugglers were hysterical, <laughs> and which I mean, even for the '90s, I thought the Smurfs was kind of a rather dated reference because I don't know if the Smurf movie had even come out then. I thought that was later. So uh, yeah, the Smurfs were kind of an old. They were a early to mid '80s kind of cartoon, right? And they, of course, they just kept showing reruns of them forever. Um, but they were pretty lame. I mean. I, like I loved them as a kid. We had like little smart figures and smart coloring books, and I mean that, that was the Smurfs and the Care Bears and everything was it. I know some of the writers of Animaniacs worked on uh, at least the Snorks, I believe. I, I love the Snorks even better. The Snorks were better than the than Smurfs. Their theme song was amazing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, oh gosh, the the Smurfs did have the worst theme song, didn't they? <laughs> That was one of the things I remember in elementary school, like one of the one of the things that I would do with my friends just as if we had to get in line, you know, your teacher tells you to get in line and go to the water fountain or go to whatever. If you just really wanted to be annoying, you just start going la 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 just going from place to place. Of course you'd have to do it in your most annoying voice as possible, so yeah. Oh the Smurfs. Uh Nathan, what did you what did you like about this cartoon? Uh, I liked when the censors were explaining what the Animaniacs, what the Warners would not be able to do by demonstrating on each other, hitting each other with briefcase and then dropping motors and things on each other. It's kind of cute. Yeah, the dropping of a of a motor engine I thought was a pretty creative use of uh, like I've never seen somebody drop a, like an engine on somebody's uh, and I was like, oh, that's a, that's something new to drop on somebody. That's cool. Yeah, I thought they were going to turn it on. Like, oh I was my like, gosh, oh, no, this is going to be so bad. Like, <laughs> uh, and I was like, OK, it could have been anything. You're just dropping, <laughs> you know, it's a <sighs> it's a new heavy thing to drop on it. Well, um, yeah. the thing I really liked about this cartoon was just the animations, particularly. I love the animation of Attila the Hun when he's going around the place and he's like just uh, going through the hall and uh going up the elevator and pulling up the the cord of the elevator i thought it looked really cool and mm-hmm. just the his facial expressions and stuff like that i i i just really liked the the design of attila the hun and how he was animated you could tell the people who were animating those uh, sequences were having a lot of fun and putting a lot of detail into those uh little scenes so yeah i feel like they missed an opportunity though because they should have done baloney Instead of the snugglers, um, particularly when we saw Baloney at the beginning of the episode, I thought that's where they were going with it. Well, me too. I kind of had that idea that, you know, these these uh, sensors were going to take them to Baloney and Friends. And I almost feel like, well, now I know who pushed the Warners into the Baloney and Friends set. Because remember that cartoon, they're introduced to Baloney and you don't really get this explanation of why the warners are going into the Mm. the thing so you think this is a prequel to maybe this might be the prequel to baloney so if you're watching this in the correct order folks you watch this cartoon before (laughs) baloney and friends and that's why they didn't show because i was like uh you know it's so new or maybe it hasn't even aired yet or something maybe i'm still there's still filming episodes of baloney exactly 
<laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but it's it's I I think that it made more sense to say okay now the censors push them into a baloney thing to show them how to do a show appropriately. I don't know. It's a very similar kind of theme though I suppose. To just to you know a commentary on kids television at the time and really what the writers had to you know face. Uh, so a lot of fourth wall breaking and a little kind of peek perhaps at what it was like to work on the show, I suppose. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and uh, get to this episode's Water Tower rating. So what do you guys think? Out of five water towers, how many water towers would you give this episode? Kelly, let's start with you. I think I'll go with three and a half. Uh, there was a lot to it as far as, you know, a bunch of different segments and, uh, thought the 2001 space references were cool. And, um, and, you know, Wallace Shawn was in it, even though he wasn't really, (laughs) (laughs) um, but, uh, so yeah, three and a half. I mean, it's, it's not one that I'd probably go and and rewatch a bunch of times like some of the others, uh, but they're, you know, it wasn't bad. All right. And Nathan, what about you? I'm going to say two and a half. I think it was slightly below average. Um, like I didn't, I didn't think the slapping squirrel one was particularly funny. Uh, and the uh, Katie Kaboom wasn't my favorite Katie Kaboom. I don't think. Um, <laughs> how can you tell? Right. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, and then the, uh, the, the, our final space, cartoon it almost didn't even feel like a cartoon because it was so short like it almost felt like another bumper just like it was just a little too long so they had to put a title card on it but yeah well yeah so i don't know like two and a half i think all right well i'm gonna go right in the middle of you guys and i'm gonna say three (laughs) um (laughs) and that's just coincidence too i I was i was thinking three from the get-go so it's just funny that i just happen to be right in the middle Again, as always, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to say three. It's, it's not a bad one. I mean, there's some, the, the segments that are, that are stronger are really good. And, but yeah, there is a couple of uh, weaker ones in there, but it's not bad by any means, there, you know, and Katie Kaboom is Katie Kaboom. I mean, it's, she is what she is. And I just, I really feel like a little bit of counseling could really help that girl. Don't, you know, you know. <laughs> Don't ignore these problems. This is what happens. And like you guys said, like who's insuring these people, you know? I don't know what mm-hmm. home insurance, like the premiums for this poor family. But whatever. I, I, she she grew out of it one way or another. Well, let's go ahead and get to our poll results. And uh, let's see here. Let's see. Poll. Oh, great. I don't have the poll results in front of me here. Um I, oh, I don't have them either. Sorry. Oh, great. Well, I think I know someone that might have them, though. No, Nathan. Yes. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to go to the person I try to ignore, but we have to go to every now and then, and that is our announcer. Woo-hoo. Hello again. This is the announcer back from I don't know where I've been. Hashtag, where am I? Well, anyway, I'm here to give you the poll results of the last week's poll. Listeners were asked, what is your favorite appearance of the flame in hashtag Animaniacs, hashtag Animaniacs poll? 12% said, Paul Revere's ride. Yeehaw! 23% said, the Star Spangled Banner. But 65% wrote in and said it was the Declaration of Independence. Well, there you go. Those are the poll results for this week. Hopefully I'll see you much more in the future. This is the announcer signing off. Now back to the studio. All right, so... There was our, there's the results of the flame poll, a uh, very hot, hotly debated topic. Uh, what was your favorite, uh, appearance I see of the what flame? You did there. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, what was your favorite appearance of the flame? Independent Declaration of Independence, uh, Paul Revere's ride, or uh, or his uh, what was it? Star Spangled Banner. What do you What do you guys yeah, think? He just He just said it. I know exactly. Uh, but Nathan, what do you think? Um, I got to go with the Declaration of Independence. It's the first and classic, and yeah, I liked it the best. And Kelly, what about you? I'll go with Paul Revere's ride. Um, it was a nice poem. And it had two flames, actually. Oh, that's true. Double your pleasure. Double your fun. Uh, with double flame gum. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with the Declaration of Independence as well. Uh, just for the fact that it, yeah, it's the original. And, um, I, I don't know. The animation, I think, was a little bit better in the Declaration of Independence one. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Anyway. Well, those were our results for last week, but let's go ahead and get to this week's poll. Nathan, what do we got? All right. Well, the fans have been asking, and here it is, uh, the best Katie Kaboom round two. <laughs> <laughs> of course they so, have. <laughs> yep. They've been demanding it, and finally we have it. So the choices are the broken date, the blemish fake, or the belly button blues. That's right. The broken date, of course, was when someone broke a date with Kelly Kaboom and the blemish that, fake. Kelly when, Kaboom. No, let's try that again. Well, oh, Katie Kaboom. No, you did not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, little. <laughs> oh. Kelly's got to uh, go Kaboom. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> so, uh, Katie Kaboom had a broken date in the broken date. And then in uh, the blemish fake, Katie Kaboom has a little pimple on her face. And of course there was today's episode Belly Button Blues where Katie the Kaboom wants to go to school with a crop top. There we are. So go ahead and head over to our Twitter page. Uh you know, twitter.com slash animaniacast or just search on Twitter for hashtag animaniacast poll and you can make your voice heard on that explosive question. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get to our contact information. Nathan, where can people get in contact with you online? Well, if you want to follow me, uh, you can do it on Twitter because I have over 40 followers now. Whoa. Uh, Django FT, that's me. And Kelly, what about you? I'm on Twitter, Yoda Princess, Y O D A P R N C S S. Or email Kelly at BigShinyRobot.com. All right. And, folks, we want to get in contact with you. So head on over to our Discord channel on their Discord app. You can get a link very easily by going to Discord.AnimaniCast.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. You can give us an email as well, which is AnimaniCast at RetroZap.com. And uh, speaking of RetroZap.com, you should head over there today because not only is it a great place to get new articles each and every day about Star Wars and pop culture, but you're also going to see tons of different podcasts, not only dealing about Star Wars, but also just a bunch of other cool topics topics as well. Uh, I'll highlight one of them I was just listening to today, and that is Techno Retro Dads. And Techno Retro Dads, they talk about a bunch of stuff from the... 70s, 80s, 90s, and today, whether it's video games or whatever's going on in Star Wars and pop culture, Techno Retro Dads talks about it each week. And Jedi Schwa does, uh, he did our artwork for the Animating Cast. So if you like our logo, then you're going to love Techno Retro Dads because Jedi Schwa puts cool artwork up for every one of the episodes. So there you go. There's a Techno Retro Dads advertisement. For them and uh, yeah, subscribe to the, the retrozap.com feed to get that podcast as well as other retrozap podcasts, such as this one, delivered straight to your device automatically and for free. Well, let's go ahead and wrap things up. So, for Nathan and Kelly, this is Joey saying good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. This podcast is not endorsed by Warner Brothers or Amblin Entertainment and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Animaniacs, the Warner Brothers logo, all names, pictures, and sounds of the Animaniacs characters or any other Animaniacs related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Warner Brothers, Amblin Entertainment, or their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the Animaniacs unless otherwise indicated. Which way did he go, George? Which way did he go?